you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to Proverbs. All of our scriptures today are in Proverbs. I'm not going to be long this morning, I know, because I already preached last night, and I already took out a couple of verses of scripture from last night. I'm also going to tell you this morning's going to be really different than my normal format, but I, I feel very burdened about this morning's message. In fact, I slept maybe, maybe three hours last night. We're going to look at Proverbs 20, 24, and 28. Holy Spirit, I ask this morning for you to speak to us. I ask for your help. I ask for revival in my nation. I don't believe you're through with America, but it's going to require your people intentionally taking charge, intentionally stepping to the plate, and establishing your kingdom on the earth. Speak to us today in Jesus' name. Anybody said? Amen. All of us probably have heard the expression, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Another phrase I came across recently is, hell is full of good intentions, but heaven is full of good works. <clears throat> I want to remind you, church, about a year and a half, two years ago, the revelation hit me that God designed the world that we live in in such a way that the most committed win. It's the most committed that win. It's not necessarily the right that win. Morality doesn't necessarily beat immorality. Good does not necessarily win over evil. It's whoever is most committed that win. And Christians had better wake up in America and recognize that just because we're right, it doesn't mean we're going to win. Now, don't go getting religious on me and go, oh, pastor, we all will win in the end. We all go to heaven. Can I tell you something? I am much more interested in getting to heaven. I want to bring heaven to earth. I'm more interested in just making it over the finish line. I want to see my nation return back to its godly heritage. I believe God called me. I believe God called you. I believe he put you on the planet for such a time as this. I believe the greatest battle and the greatest victory is yet to be seen if the church would rise up. Could somebody say amen? See, we got to recognize, listen, and let's be honest, who is winning America? It's, can I tell you, the homosexuals are doing a whole lot better job than the Christians. And there's not nearly as many homosexuals as there are Christians. But they're so committed, and they have been at it. They have had an agenda, and they have been faithful to it for decades now. Can I tell you, Islam is more effective than Christians right now. There's not near as many Muslims in America as there are Christians but can I tell you, they have had a very fine-focused agenda for decades. And they have been working at it, and they have been patiently working behind the scenes. And we're just now starting to see the fruits of their labors. It's not the ones who are right who will win. It's the ones who are most committed. And church, it's time for us to wake up and get committed to this thing called Christianity. Monday and Tuesday, I had a an experience that I, I'm certain I will never forget. I went at the invitation um, to uh, what they called a renewal project in Lansing, in our capital, this past Monday and Tuesday. Spent two days there with over 400 pastors and their wives. We all were invited to come to this event. And for two days, I'm talking nonstop. You think Pentecostal services are long? Dude, I'm talking for two days straight, nonstop. Okay? Back after back, back after back. I, we had politician after politician stand in front of us pastors and basically with tears streaming down their face, begging us to stop getting locked jaw, stand up in the pulpit, and start dealing with the issues of today. I'm telling you. Of course, you know it didn't take a whole lot to get my feathers ruffled on that one. But they stood up one after one uh, uh, that stood up, and they basically said this. This is what they said. 
They said, pastors, there are those of us who are called to the political arena, who believe in Christ, who want to see our nation turn back to Christ, but we can't get in office because you can't get your people off the pew into the poll house. And they begged us. I remember if that, that we, we started, we started, uh, and, and they reminded us. They said, pastors, you were not called to captain the love boat. You were called to command the battleships. I was like, come on. And they were begging us. I mean, we started with, who did we start with? I can't even remember. Put it up there for me. Uh, we, we, we started with Attorney General Bill Shute. Bill Shute got up. And can I tell you something? I have personally been in the presence of Bill Shute uh, four or five times now. And Michigan is blessed to have that man of God as an attorney general. Amen. And he got, I'm telling you, the man stands for righteousness. He stands by the law. And, and he, doesn't, he, doesn't, he does not interpret the law. He enforces the law. And he is a, a man of God. And he stood up again, was just pleading with us. Then our senator from from Texas, Ted Cruz, flew up here and again stood in front of us, a man of God, a man of integrity, a, 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 a righteous man who loves his country and, and, and spoke to us and challenged us to get involved. Then, we had, uh, then I heard uh, an attorney, John Stenberger, and John Stenberger, uh, he said, pastors, I need to educate you because you're ignorant. It's basically what he said. He said, you're ignorant, and your ignorance has given you lockjaw. He said, let me tell you something. You can do anything you want to do in your churches and through your churches concerning politics, except for this. You cannot stand up on Sunday morning. I could not stand up on Sunday morning and say, Rochester First Assembly is standing behind this candidate. I cannot do that. But I could, we could give money to a candidate if we wanted to. We can promote candidate. I can promote a candidate if I want to. I do not lose my rights as a citizen of the United States just because I'm a pastor. And I can stand in front of you. I can stand in front of you and I can tell you I am going to vote for such and such. And if you don't like it, just squat. Listen, I can, I can say I'm going to vote for such and such. This is the reason why I'm going to vote for such and such because he stands for this and this and the other. And I'm not voting for so-and-so because this is how they voted and this is what they did. And, and, and he said, we have every right to do that. Yeah. By the way, if you haven't done it recently, read up on pastors, our founding father pastors. Pastors would come, listen, pastors would come to the church with gun and arms. And he would, he, would, he would rally the troops, and he'd say, let's go fight, boys. And they would lead them in physical battle. If it wasn't for pastors, we'd still be bowing down to the queen today. Pastors stood up and dealt and led the way politically on issues. They were standing up, begging us. Then I had the awesome privilege of being able to see firsthand Mike Huckabee, what a man of God, brilliant man of God, who eloquently addressed us and challenged us. And uh, again, and I'm not going to list them all, but just a couple more. The next one you need to know about, and that is one of our Supreme Court justices, and that's uh, David Viviano, and you need to remember his name. He was appointed to the Supreme Court of Michigan by our present governor, Rick Snyder. And um, again, a man of God, Catholic by faith, a strong man of God. And the reason you need to know his name is because he's coming up for election this time. And I will tell you, I'm voting for the man. I believe he's a man of God. And um, uh, he's coming up for election this time. And then, and then we listened to David Barton, one of my heroes, a historian, a, a true historian of the American heritage. And again, he, he, he just, this man is, I, I wish I had half, I wish I had the brains in his pinky. I mean, every time I've heard him, he's given a different presentation and he quotes it from memory. He has no notes, he just quotes. And, and he went through the Constitution of the United States and he showed where there was probably about 20 verses 
in the Bible that's in the Constitution of the United States. We don't know it because we're ignorant of the Bible today. And he says, you've been lied to with this whole separation of church and state thing that is not in the Constitution, that's in none of the Founding Fathers' letters, uh, uh, writings whatsoever. And, uh, and, and again, begging us to get involved. And then, um, and then the last person I listened to, because uh, I, I, the last couple of hours I just was so messed up I had to go to the prayer house, and I was only a couple hours away from where I go to pray. And um, I've cried more this week than I have cried in a long time. It hit me this week. I was reading through Hebrews chapter 5, verse 7, and it says this, speaking of Jesus. When he was in the flesh, he offered up prayers with strong crying and wailing. And God convicted me. Because church, I remember prayer meetings where we would lift up our voice in earnestness with strong cries and tears like our Jesus did. But now we are too mature for that. Now we are so sure of our authority and we're just going to come and soak in his presence. Now church, listen, there's a time to soak and there's a time to arm up and say, devil, enough is enough. Enough is enough. I've cried. I went to the prayer room. I couldn't handle it anymore. I went to the prayer room and I cried for a few hours before I drove back to Rochester. The last person I got to listen to is this amazing woman, Gail McWilliams, who chose to be blind. And she literally chose to be blind. When she had her first child, she realized that when she was carrying her baby, there was this disease that she has that affected her eyes. And she, began, she lost a little bit of her sight. When she had her second child, she actually was technically labeled as blind. When she had her third child, her doctor walked into the office and he said, you have a choice to make, either your eyesight or your child. She said, that is no choice. <laughs> That's no choice. I will have my baby. He said, you are a fool, and walked out of the room. And since then, she's had two more children. And she goes around preaching and teaching for life. One of those politicians, I can't remember who it was, said, why are we so shocked that America's not doing anything about the beheading of these children in America, uh, over in Iraq? Why are we so shocked about that? We've been murdering our unborn children for years. It's the same thing, out of sight, out of mind. We've already got calloused hearts. Why are you so shocked? It's time for us to wake up and say enough is enough. Can somebody say amen? amen. So I'll just let you know I'm going to be participating in Pulpit Fried Freedom. October 5th. I've already signed up. It's already registered. And I'm going to preach. I'm going to preach on political issues on October 5th and just dare the IRS to sue me. They're not going to do it. You know why? Because they don't have a leg to stand on. Preachers have been doing it for years. And they don't want to take it to court because they know if they take it to court, they're going to lose. And when that happens, the lie that we've all been duped to will be exposed. They don't want that. Come on, church. I'm going to tell you something else. This preacher right now needs to know you're behind me. Because I feel like it. I feel like it.
Because I feel like destiny's on my life. I really do. I don't, listen, I don't think of myself as a bag of peanuts. I, and friend, I don't. I don't. But I feel such destiny on my life. And I carry such a burden on my heart. And uh, I believe that we could change America. Do you understand that in our primary that we just did a week and a half ago, I came in on Wednesday morning hearing my staff figure up that less than 10% of those who are 18 and older in Oakland County determined the outcome of that election. Do you understand, church, that if everybody who just calls themselves Christian would be registered and be educated and vote biblically, we could put men and women who are willing to sacrifice their political career in order to turn our nation around. And, and listen, we have got to pray. I know it's by His Spirit, but I can't tell you something. Prayers without action is not faith. It's wishful thinking. And we have got to pray our guts out, and then we've got to be about the Father's business in, every, in any way that we can. See, we've all heard it. All that's needed for evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing. I, I, I'm constantly reminded that on the night that Jesus, the most difficult night of Jesus' life, the night before he was crucified, he pleaded with his disciples on a number of occasions, pray with me, I need you right now, I need you right now. The, your sin, the weight of the world was upon his shoulders. And all his disciples kept falling asleep. He would wake them up. Would you wake up? Would you wake up? The only one that was not asleep was Judas, who was busy about doing wickedness. We have got to wake up in this hour but I got good news, church. Light always expels darkness. Always. Friend, when I go in my house at night and I flip on a light switch, I do not sit there and watch this battle of whether or not darkness is going to flee. The moment I hit that light switch, poof! Hello. Light always wins over darkness. But here's what else I know. Darkness will wait patiently for the light to get weary and then it'll race right back in. We have got to keep the light of the gospel strong in America. Jesus said the gates of hell cannot withstand the advancing powers of the kingdom of God. And the problem is not with his promises. The problem is with his people. And we have got to get activated and busy about the Father's business. Therefore, we're going to come to our key verse this morning, and that's Proverbs 20, verse 4. And it says this. It says, A sluggard does not plow in season, so at harvest time he looks but finds nothing. This verse of Scripture has always riveted inside of me. Every month whenever I read through, this verse of Scripture always just permeates in my spirit. And I'm not calling you sluggards this morning, okay? But let me just propose to you that a sluggard is someone who does not live life intentionally. A sluggard is one who lets life happen to him. A sluggard is one who does things when he feels like it, not necessarily when he ought to be doing it. A sluggard, a sluggard is not disciplined and doesn't push through when it's time to push through. He does it whenever he wants to do it. And therefore, when it's time for harvest time, he goes and he looks for it, but he doesn't find it. Listen, church, can I tell you, you know, we, we love to even quote verses of Scripture like, he who seeks finds. Well, you know what? If you haven't planted seed, you can seek all you want to, but that doesn't mean you're going to guarantee that to find something. You've got to put your shoulder to the plow and be about the Father's business. See, a sluggard, I want you to notice, this, the sluggard has ground to plow. Every one of us, God has given to us ground to plow. Every one of us, not only that, but he has the ability to plow it. God has given to each one of us giftings and callings. He's given to each one of us the ability to fulfill the purposes and the plans of God in our life. The sluggard's problem is not that he doesn't have a field. The sluggard's problem is not 
that he doesn't have the ability to do it. There's only one reason why he doesn't do it, and it's because he doesn't feel like it. He doesn't feel like it. Can I tell you, the fool is governed by his feelings, but the wise governs his feelings. The immature is governed by their feelings, but the mature governs their feelings. Children only make their bed when they feel like it. Mature people make their bed whether they feel like it or not. See, it's time for us. Listen, just because you get older doesn't mean you become more mature. You can be really old and still very immature. And it's time for us to grow up and become responsible citizens. It's time for us to live intentional lives. But the problem is, is in America, we seek a life of ease. And a life of ease prevents us from plowing in season. If you study individuals or families or history at all, you will know that often the generation that grows up in a life of luxury will lose that status because they do not understand the sacrifice and the hard work that was intent that had to be put into building the prosperity. They do not go through the tough times that was required to build it and that built the character that is required to maintain a state of blessing and favor. You see it in individual families. There'll be a generation. They work hard. They, they blood, with the blood, sweat, and tears, and they build this, this empire. And then they have children that grow up under those luxuries, and they go, I want to cuss there. They want to go wild. They just go wild. Why? Because they didn't go through the hardship that built the character that brought the blessing of the Lord and the favor of God and the prosperity. And in America, we have a generation that does not even know the sacrifice that has been paid by countless men and women who died for our freedoms. We're, we're, we're lazy and we're easygoing and it's caused us to be self-centered. And it's caused a horrible dilemma in America. See, listen to me, plowing season, I'm not a farmer, but I know this much, plowing season is the end of the winter and early spring. That's when it's time to plow. You, it, it's, it's still cold outside. It's not, it's not beyond, I mean, it's, it's, it's bearable, but it's uncomfortable, it's not pleasant. And, 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 and a sluggard would, would, would convince himself it's too cold. It's too cold and it's unpleasant. And they don't, and when this is written, they didn't have the luxury of the tractors and, and tillers that we have now. They had to do it by hand and plow, and the ground is still cold, for, uh, hard from the winter and cold, and they're having to work hard. And, and it's still cold outside, digging up the rocks. And it's not easy. And it's easy to talk yourself out of doing what you need to do because it's just not pleasant. I would rather go on another week of vacation. And so they, they don't plow when it's time to plow. Can I remind you, Ecclesiastes 11.4 in the New Living Translation says, if you wait for the perfect conditions, you will never get anything done. There's always a reason not to plow. But we got to be plowing. You first have to plow to get out the rocks and the weeds. And then you go back a few weeks later and you plow again to plow in the seeds. It's not an easy job. It's not a fun job. It's not a pleasant job. But it's necessary if you want fruit. And I want you to notice in this verse of Scripture, it does not say the slugger doesn't plow. I believe the slugger does plow. The problem is, is he doesn't plow in season. He 
waits until the ground has really thawed out really good and it's nice and soft and it's pleasant outside the birds. And then he goes out in the, in, and he joins the outdoors to do his plowing. But it's too late, Jack. You're behind time. By the time you get the seed in the ground, it is, the, the, the harvest is not going to come in in time and you're not going to have the fruit. You've got to plow in season, not in your timing, but in his. And can I take just a moment just to be personal in this room? I thank those of you who have heard my heart and who have gone the extra mile to come early to pray and to seek God during services. It makes a difference. Hosea says that Judah plows. Praise plows. And, and, and I thank God for those who will come early and who will plow. And listen, this no condemnation. I just preached no condemnation that last week. Okay? All right? And I understand if you have little children and all that kind of stuff, it can make it difficult. I can understand that. But can I tell you that those who come early and who plow and prepare their hearts first and then ask God to prepare this place, they're the ones that get the full benefit of the seed that's being planted when it's preached in the house of God. The ones who habitually, lazily just come late. You don't understand that your heart hasn't had the ability to be plowed up. And so the seed will fall upon hard ground. And you'll leave here hungry. You leave here going, wish the preacher would feed me. No, friend, let me tell you, we've got to prepare our own hearts. See, you've got to be there when, when it's time, not on your convenient schedule. Proverbs 24, verse 30 says this. And I actually am skipping one of my verses that I used last night because of time. But Proverbs 24, 30 says this. I went to the past, the field of the sluggard, the undisciplined one, the one that kind of let life happen to him. He wasn't intentional in his living. He just kind of, whenever he felt like doing things. And I went by his field and I noticed and, and by past the vineyard of the man who lacked judgment. He didn't have enough sense to understand you got to do it at the timing. And this is what I found. I found thorns that had come up everywhere. And I found the ground that was covered with weeds. And I, even the stone wall that someone somewhere in the past had gone to the uh, trouble of building not just some weak little wall, but a strong, hefty wall because it wasn't taken care of, was finally being decayed one by one. And I saw that there were breaches in the wall. He goes on in verse 32 to say that, that I, and I applied to my heart what I saw. I, I took notice of it. I wasn't judging the person, but I took notice of something with the person who isn't intentional in their living. And I learned this lesson. And he said this, a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. And guess what? Poverty will come on you like a bandit, and scarcity like an armed man. Now listen, church, we I just preached recently, enter into his rest. There is a time of rest, but there's a time to work. And, and there's a time to be about the business of the Father. And he said, you know, we all can convince ourselves we need a little bit more sleep, we need a little bit more rest. Well, church, I tell you, it's time to suck it up and, and let's move forward in Christ. Say, so, listen, church, your life is God's gift to you. And what you do with it is your gift to God. I don't want to waste my life. I, I, I want to work myself to the bones and then I want to pray myself alive again. You hear me? I, I want to give everything I got to him. I, don't, I never, I never want to be slack. I need to know when to rest. And Jane and I are going to Mackinac Island tomorrow. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Pray that it doesn't rain. <laughs> anyway. But can we observe a couple of things from this verse? Number one is this. I want to propose to you that your soul is one of the fields that we have to take care of. We got to plow it. We got to plant. We got to protect. Now listen, there's a lot of fields, okay? Your family is a field. Your, your, your job is your field. Your neighborhood is your field. Rochester, or what community you live in, is your field. The United States of America is our field. 
But I want to talk to you about your soul this morning. I want to talk to you about you this morning. Your soul is, is your field that you need to plow and you need to plant and you need to protect it. I love, I love a story in a book. Uh, and the book is uh, The Pursuit of Excellence by Ted Engstrom. And in it, he shares this story. He says, a pastor once made an investment in a large piece of ranch real estate, which he hoped to enjoy during his years of retirement. And while he was still an active pastor, he would take one day a week, each week, to go out to his land and work. But what a job. What he had bought, he soon realized, was several acres of weeds, gopher holes, and run-down buildings. It was anything but attractive. But the pastor knew it had potential, and he stuck with it. Every week he would go to his ranch, crank up his small tractor, and plow the weeds with uh, vengeance. Then he would spend time doing repairs in the building. He would mix concrete. He would cut lumber, repair broken windows, work on the plumbing. It was hard work. But after several months, the place began to take shape. And every time the pastor would put his hands to some task, he began to swell with a godly pride. And he knew that his labors were finally paying off. When the project was completed, the pastor received a neighborly visit from a farmer who lived a few miles down the road. Farmer Brown took a long look at the preacher and cast a longer eye on the revitalized property. And then he nodded with approval. And he said, well, preacher, looks like you and the good Lord really did some good work here. Pastor wiped the sweat from his brow and he answered, it's interesting you should say that, Mr. Brown, because I've got to tell you the truth. You should have seen this place when God had it all by himself. <laughs> there are certain things that only God can do, but there's other things that we have to do. Amen. He's not going to do our job for us. And we must be intentional in caring for what God has entrusted to us. You can't take it for granted. Paul said, Paul said, there's only one thing that's required of us as stewards, and that is that we be found faithful. You, you, listen, you're not going to have a great marriage by accident. You're just not going to stumble up on it. You're not going to have a healthy family by accident. You're not going to be healthy when you get older by accident. You're not going to have a good retirement by accident. You're not, going to have a, you're not going to have a lot of wonderful friends by accident. If you're going to have these things that we all desire in life, it's going to be when we intentionally pour ourselves into them as we give ourselves to planting, uh, plowing and planting, and then reaping those benefits. The good things in life don't just come. God has given us a plan, and if we will work the plan, we will reap the benefits. Amen. Second thing I want you to notice is that not only, not, not only are our fields often without fruit, but oftentimes they're just completely overgrown with thorns and weeds. And, you know, if, if you want to find my house, just drive down Clopton Bridge and find the yard, that was, which is the worst shape, you'll find my house. I have the worst yard in the neighborhood. I know all of my, my neighbors are praying for the preacher to hurry up and get busy, you know. I, can I tell you, <laughs> and, and I'm not proud of that, I'm just being honest with you, but you know what, if you want a nice looking yard, you've got to give it attention. You gotta fertilize that puppy a couple of times a summer and you gotta cut the grass and water it and I'm too thrifty to water it. And, and, and you know, you, you gotta do those things. If you don't, what happens is weeds, thorns begin to come up. And, and what's true with my yard is true in your marriage. It's true in your emotional life. It's true in your mental life. It's true in your children. It's true at work. And we got to give ourselves attention to that which God's given to us. Third thing is, notice the fence was torn down. We have to be proactive in protecting our fields from the invasion of the enemy that would want to slowly tear down the stone walls. We've got to constantly be giving attention to those things, putting a guard around those things the enemy wants to kill. See, most people have great intentions, but very few have intentional living. Most people. Can I tell you that I'm embarrassed how many times I have good intentions 
but for some reason it doesn't follow through. Somebody will come to my mind, I go, I got to give them a call, and I don't have their number in my phone, and by the time I get to the office, I forgot to call them, and then another week or two goes by, and I go, oh, I got to call so-and-so, and then I don't, it's embarrassing. It happens to me every day. You know, you, you, it, you've got to be intentional in every area of your life. And can I tell you something else? It's got to be every day. Every day. See, the Bible says in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 15, look at it. It says this. It says, see, I set before you today. Say today. 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 I set before you an option. Life and prosperity or death and destruction. Your choice. Can I tell you, stop asking the question right and wrong. Start asking your question life and death. It'll help you make the decision a little bit easier. He says, and he says, today. Can I tell you, and if you've been around here very long, you've heard me say this. Every morning when I consciously come awake, my mind immediately goes here. And I say, good morning, Lord. I don't do it out loud because I don't want to wake up Jane. But I, in, my, in my spirit, I say, good morning, Lord. I choose to serve you today. And we're going to have a good day. I do that every morning of my life as far back as I can remember. In other words, I make a commitment to make Jesus Lord of my life every day. I make a commitment before I roll my feet out of the bed that I am going to do my best to make him Lord, that I'm going to do what he wants me to do, not what I feel like doing, and I'm going to be obedient to him. I want to honor him. It's something you got to do every day. Today I set before you a choice, either life and prosperity or blessing or death and destruct destruction. For I command you today... This is what you do today. Love the Lord your God. Walk in his ways. Keep his commandments, decrees, and laws. Then you will live and increase. I believe he wants us to always be increasing. And the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you've entered in to possess. And then down verse 19, he says it again. Today or this day, I call heaven and earth as a witness against you that I set before you a choice. You have life or death. You have blessing or you have cursing. And then if you're not smart enough to figure it out, he even gives you the answer. So choose life. And if you really are that dense, I will give you the test and I'll give you the answer. The answer is life. Choose life so that you, may, you and your children may live and that you may love the Lord your God and that you would listen to his voice and that you would hold fast to him for the Lord is your life. And he will give you many years in the land that he swore to your fathers. It's about today. Jesus said to those that followed him in Luke chapter 9, verse 23, he said, then say to them all, if anyone would come unto me, let him deny himself. You know what that means? That means let him not give to his emotions. You don't do what you want to do. You're a soldier. You don't. Get up out of bed when you want to. You don't make the bed you want to well, the way you want to. You get up when the bugle sounds. You make a bed a certain way. You spit shine your shoes a certain way. You have to have a certain kind of haircut. You're a soldier of the Lord. You deny yourself. You don't live as the foolish slouch. You deny. And you take up his cross. How often? Daily. It's not a one-time decision, church. It's a daily decision. And follow me. See, you know, I, I think that we even got it wrong in this whole living by the Spirit mentality. Can I tell you, I believe that you've got to live intentionally if you're going to live in the Spirit. You've got to intentionally not listen to your head and be tuned into the Spirit. You've got to intentionally not do what... Lean to your own understanding, but you've got to acknowledge him in all your ways. That's an intentional lifestyle. It's not this K sera, sera, flippant thing that we often see in modern day charismatic. That is not living in the spirit. That's being irresponsible. Jesus was not irresponsible. 
Jesus was tuned with the Spirit so that, so that he would wake up and say, we got to go to Canaan today. And they're going, what? Well, because, and he didn't say it out loud, but a while ago when I was in prayer, while you guys were still sleeping, I was in prayer. God said I had to go to Canaan because, you know what, there's a woman at the well that I'm going to be leading to the Jesus. And he was led by the Spirit. He knew where he was going that day. Why? Because he was disciplined. He was intentional to sit down and hear the voice of God and then obey. That's Spirit-led life. It's an intentional life, an intentional dying to yourself taking up your cross and following him. My last verse this morning is Proverbs 28, verse 19. It's good news because it says this, if you're not a sluggard, but if you will work your land, you'll always have abundant food. If you'll, if you'll be faithful with what God gives to you, you will always have an abundance. But he who chases after fantasies will always be in poverty. A faithful man will be richly blessed but he who's eager to get rich in other words he's looking for these quick rich schemes can I tell you something he will not go unpunished church I'm calling you this morning to be more intentional to live an intentional life underneath all of your prayer, uh, uh, chairs I have intentionally put a piece of paper I want you to reach underneath there right now and many of you have a pen. If, the, if you need a pen and there's not one under your chair, there's probably one next to it. If you have a pen yourself, I want everybody, everybody's answering the altar call this morning. This is the altar call. I told you it's going to be different. This is the altar call. And I want you to work through it with me. I don't want you working ahead of me, okay? Holy Spirit, this morning, we are not interested in coming and feeling good, and crying, and going on our way without changing our behavior. But Holy Spirit, I ask right now that you, you would turn the searchlight on in every one of our lives, and that we would make some intentional changes this week. Everybody got a pen? Everybody got a paper? If you don't, raise your hand, we'll help you. Everybody got a pen and paper? What do you need, sweetheart? A pen. You got one now. Anybody else? You can turn it down just a little bit. We're going to intentionally make some decisions this morning. This is gut decisions this morning. Number one is this. I want, to ask you, I want you to ask yourself, what area of your life have you not plowed recently? Now I put some suggestions on the screen. And I want you to pick one this morning. You can go back and do this again later. But I don't want you to get spread out too thin. We're all, we're all spread out too thin. But maybe some of you, you have not been giving your family the attention you need to be giving. Now listen, we are constantly having to adjust and readjust, right? And we're in seasons. You need to know what season you're in. Some of you, you need to start taking your spouse out on a date again. Some of you need to start taking out your children on dates. Hear me? Some of you, and grandparents, you can take out your grandbabies on dates. But some of you, can I tell you something? The most important thing to me is family. It's family, Sherry. Some of you, maybe it's family. Others of you, maybe, it's, maybe it is your spiritual life. You, you, you haven't been as faithful to read and pray and wait before God. Maybe you, had, maybe you used to fast once a week and now it's been months since you fasted. Maybe that's where you need to adjust. Maybe it's your emotional life. Maybe what you need to do is play a little bit. I'm ready for deer season. Play a little bit. Maybe you need, maybe, maybe you need mentally. Some of you, maybe it's been months since you've read a book. Shame on you. Shame on you. You have the ability to read and you have information at your fingertips. You need, to, you need to get your stinking eyes off of the TV and put it in a good book. Grow, learn, challenge yourself. Some of you, you've gotten away from the physical fitness thing. And, and maybe it's just even just eating properly and sleeping properly. Social life. Maybe you, you, you need to get connected again with friends. 
could be your economical life, your, your finances are in shambles, you're not on a budget, you don't have a clue where your money's going, and you got to suck it up again. Maybe it's just your stinking attitude. Can I tell you something? We need to constantly be grateful every day for the blessings of God. I tell Deborah, I want three thank you notes on my desk every week because I always want to be thankful for those who have contributed to the goodness of my life. Maybe we just need to have an attitude adjustment. We're finding ourselves complaining and belly aching and woe is me. When if you start counting your blessings instead of your woes, it could turn your life around. I want you to list at least one thing, but I don't want you to list a bunch. But what area of your life have you not been plowing in lately? Second question is this. What intentional action do you need to make to get your garden prepared for fruitfulness? Can I tell you, some of us need to just start with repentance. God, forgive me. I allowed my, my attention to get distracted. And I just assumed that my spouse would understand. I just assumed my family would understand. Whatever the case might be. But I, what, maybe, maybe you need to find you an accountability partner. You've tried this, you've tried to do something, you've tried, and, and you just can't do it. And you need an accountability partner to go to the gym with you. You need an accountability partner to call you up and say, hey, did you take out your wife this week? You need an accountability partner to help you. Hey, you've been keeping your eyes pure. Maybe, maybe that's what you need. Maybe you need to rearrange your calendar. Can I tell you something? Control your calendar. Don't let your calendar control you. Make an adjustment in your calendar. You are in, you are in control of your destiny. Line it up with what God wants. Maybe you need to make a fresh commitment to discipline. You've gotten lazy. You've gotten a slack. Summer can do that to us. Maybe you just need to establish some clear goals. You don't even know where you're going. Or you don't even know why those goals are important. You'll never keep a goal if you don't know why the goal is important. And can I tell you, a goal for losing, uh, to, for losing weight is not so I weigh 10 pounds less. You'll never do it. You've got to have a better reason than that. I try to stay fit, not so that I, I look good, but because I want to I be healthy all the days of my life. I want to be here for my great-grandkids. I don't want to spend all my money on health care in 20 years from now. Hello. It's not just so I'm 10 pounds lighter. Okay? But so what, what, is it, what is the intentional action that you need to make? Number three. And this is one we miss a lot. What rocks or obstacles are, are going to rise up if you try this again? I guarantee every time, how many of you realize every time you step out to do something, you, there's always what? An obstacle. So, so can we start expecting it? Can I tell you that a coach on a football team understands there's going to be obstacles between his offense and the goal line? And he prepares for that. And he studies the defense of every team, and every team is different. And he prepares for the obstacle. So what relationship is going to bow up? Maybe there's some relationships you've got to remove from your life. Maybe there's relationships that you're going to be ready to deal with. Maybe, maybe there are expectations that people have upon you. And, and, and you know what? It's time for them to take responsibility for themselves. Maybe, maybe there's some changes you've got to do in your health or your finances. Maybe an obstacle is lack of experience. I, 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 I laugh at the, at the number of young musicians out there that want to be a Nate Marielke, but they're not willing to practice. They're not willing to go to school. Not, hey, listen, you don't do that by accident. You've got to get the exercise. You've got to get the experience. Maybe it's just a lack of willpower and you need a, a greater reason to keep you strong and on track. Number four, what can I do to prepare for that obstacle? Do I need some training? Do I need a partner? Because two of us can do a whole lot more than one. Do I need to make some financial changes? Do I need to 
understand that this is going to take some time and give myself some time and not get over anxious and quit because I, I ran for two weeks and I'm still 20 pounds overweight? I mean, come on. But what are you going to do to overcome those? And number five is what specific action am I intentionally going to take today or this week? I want you to write it down. What am I going to do today about this area? What am I going to do this week about this area? See, repentance, church, is more than coming in front of everybody and being embarrassed and crying. Repentance is changing your ways. It's making adjustments. I was behaving this way, and I recognize that it's ruining my life. I'm recognizing it's a weed and a thorn and a rock. And I'm turning, and I'm no longer going to do that. And I'm going to start plowing. I'm going to start planting. I'm going to start going in the way of life, not destruction. So, Father, this morning, we want to live intentionally. We want to die to ourselves. We want to die to just that, Nate, thank you. We, we, we want to die to just doing what we feel like doing, but we want to walk in your spirit. We want to be good stewards of that which you give to us. Father, you have entrusted to everyone under the sound of my voice with gifts and callings and talents, and you expect us to fulfill that. We all believe that you have given us a purpose in life. Let us be purposeful in pursuing it. Let us be purposeful in pursuing it. Father, forgive me. Forgive me whenever I let you down. always strive in a healthy way to be everything that you want me to be. We want to honor you in every area of our life. We want to please you. For this is the establishing of the kingdom of God. And establishing kingdom people. In Jesus' name.